no altered sleep cycle, no malar rash, photosensitivity, or uh, viral ulcers. So can, here, you go, can you go to the previous slide? What was the chief? Previous slide. So the one thing is she had some burning sensation, but most importantly, she had loss of appetite and there was a bit of an abdominal bloating. And in fact, she had one vague. She's not able. Was not able to describe vague abdominal pain she had. And that's what uh, she said. So, anything else in the history you want here, Marco? Yes. Is there any vomiting associated vomiting? There's no vomiting, but she said uh, uh, she was not able to eat. She had a vague uh, abdominal pain. It was not a very severe pain. It was a dull, boring pain. Yes. Sir. And she said uh, she was not able to eat, and yes, hence that's why she was she had a, a significant weight loss of seven kgs in six months. Yes, sir. She had a bit of a back pain. Yes, sir. Back uh, pain was not related to any of these uh, <clears throat> symptoms. She had. I, I agree that she had come with a very, very, a very vague uh, symptoms, not localizing to anything. Okay. Okay. Mm. Bhargav, you think the patient's got a liver problem or you think the patient's got more of a GI? What is it? What should your, what should your focus of attention be in this patient? Uh, the other person who is... Uh, uh, who is the other person? I think more of uh, GI related and I, I would like to also keep uh, malignancy in mind because of significant weight. Yeah. Okay. 59 with some sort of epigastric discomfort, abdominal bloating, loss of appetite, significant weight loss. I think, yeah, most important thing is that can be some sort of a GI malignancy. And if somebody comes with this sort of a pain where there's significant weight loss and loss of appetite, I do agree this may not be, this could be some sort of a GI neoplasm we need to think of. Okay? Yes. And among uh, the among the geo neo, uh, neoplasms, anybody else can take up this question. Uh, who's the other person? A uh, Purva. Purva. Uh, yeah. Yes. yes sir. Yeah. Can you just take up this issue of abdominal bloat, loss of weight, loss of appetite? What will be your thought yes. process? Ma'am, uh, elderly, uh, middle-aged female with uh, these kinds of non-specific abdominal-related complaints. Uh, given it's not the non-specific. It's not non-specific. No, it's quite specific. Three weeks and yes. there is loss yes. of appetite and significant weight yes, loss sir, weight for loss. six months. Yes, that's a very, very sir. significant symptom in a 59 year old lady. Yes, sir. So, we yes. would, I would like to keep a GI malignancy as one of the uh, DDs, or also, uh, if she, sir, would is there also associated fatigue with these complaints? Uh, uh, easy fatigability, agree. Uh, one, uh, yeah, what are the other uh, questions you would like to know or like to ask? If this patient you think has got a GI malignancy, sir, uh, fatigue, anorexia. Um, she has got uh, anorexia. She has got weight loss. Then, yes, sir. <laughs> uh, any fever if she is having? Uh, no, no. Most important thing is early satiety. Early satiety. Early satiety. Postprandial bloating. What are the causes of early satiety? Uh, Ma'am, early uh, satiety could be either it could be a structural lesion uh, such as a mass compressing on the pylorus or uh, the D1 causing an outlet obstruction. Or what would be the presentation? Be... What would be the presentation if there was a mass compressing or this intrinsic mass? What would be the main presentation? Uh, Ma'am, in such a case, the patient would complain of a postprandial abdominal distension or it could also be bloating and vomiting of the regurgitated. So vomiting. So, so vomiting. So vomiting will be a feature of this mechanical obstruction, no? Yes, ma'am. So if this is just uh, abdominal bloat, so you need to know whether there is vomiting or not. BT, yes, uh, in VK, vomiting is there? Yeah, uh, there was no vomiting. No vomiting. But, uh, yeah. So somebody has an elderly lady with this sort of, I think I do agree, one is early society, bloating, anorexia, weight <laughs> And some of these malignancies can also have pain increased after food. Okay, so as Madam said, early satiety can happen when there is, as you said, a, a anthropyloric lesion. Or where else can you get it? If you have an infiltrative lesion in the stomach, which could reduce the capacity, size of, the capacity of the stomach. So which which diseases can reduce the capacity of the stomach? 
what infiltrate into in the stomach can fundic uh, fundic growths would uh, yeah. decrease uh, no i'm talking about something which infiltrating that means infiltrating the stomach <coughs> linitis linitis something which cause thickening of the stomach you lymphoma know? linitis so uh, what are the things what are the stomach what are the conditions malignant conditions which can cause thickening of the stomach thereby reducing the peristalsis and reducing the or the reducing the compliance of the stomach and as madam said it could be linitis plastica number 2 Adenosia yeah. stomach. Pardon? Adenocarcinoma. Yes, stomach. Adenosia stomach, sir. Oh. No, adenosia of the stomach can come as a mass lesion. It can come as a as a gastric ulcer. It can also come as a mass lesion. The mass lesion can, if you have an adenosia in the body of the stomach, you may come as early satiety. Mm -hmm. But if you have in the anthropology, you will come with an obstructive symptom. Obstructive. But I am talking about something is something which is causing thickening of the stomach wall. <laughs> So that could be lymphoma, the linitis plastica, lymphoma. and some of the benign disease also can have it. Menetrius, yes, menetrius, yes, menetrius disease, Crohn's disease. Crohn's. Crohn's disease can cause, and eosinophilic gastroenteritis can cause all these things. Okay, so these are by the time, but any lady with nearly 60 years comes with this. I do agree, we need to think of probably a uh, upper mm -hmm. GI malignancy. Yes. Can pancreatic malignancy present like this? Yes, sir. That could also be a early presentation. Early presentation. Okay. Can can it just be a gastroparesis of say hypothyroid yes. state and all, or no, yes, diabetic sir. gastroparesis? Yes, sir. could also be. There would be less of pain and more of uh, bloating. Uh, yeah, but what will not be weight loss will not be this significant. Weight no, loss will not be tight target and it's a tight you may get fullness, but weight loss is something that is striking in this patient. Malignant. So that's important. Any other questions you'd like to ask in this patient with this symptom? With this presentation. What are the other things that you'll ask? One is vomiting, we said. Number two. And Bobby, supposing time, supposing there is a gastric outlet obstruction. Apart from vomiting, what else can you cause? Sir, uh, that uh, visible abdominal lump after means or any visible fullness or dysfunction after stomach, the... It's very difficult to look at a lump because stomach is too thing. You need a big mass to produce a lump. But um, mm -hmm. they can develop heartburn, isn't it? Yes. They can have burnt heartburn and regurgitation. All these things, sir. And the regurgitation will be of very, very foul, foul smelling and... Foul smelling. Six, Normal six, GERD will not produce so much of foul smelling. Foul smelling, regurgitation. Exactly. But if you have a regurgitation which is very, very foul smelling, that means there is a there is a considerable stasis in the stomach. Stasis in the stomach. What are the Can other questions? Go? What other things? What will be the so what the best way to understand this when a patient like this comes? Mm -hmm. No, the pathology can be in the fundus. The pathology can be in the antrum. So if it is in the fundus, mm -hmm. the question that the, what crosses your mind is. The heart burn, you know, it can have a regurgitation. Dysphagia will be a major feature. So you have to ask the dysphagia in this patient. And then, so what I always discuss, you know, you take the pathology and then discuss what can happen proximally, what can happen locally with the tumor, and what can happen distally. So everything gets covered up. So we suspect, say, antrum growth, proximally we get vomiting, we'll have halitosis, we'll have heartburn. As far as the growth is concerned, we can have a GI bleed. It can be occult, it can be obscure, it may be just present as anemia, particularly. Melina. Yeah. And what can happen distally, they'll have secondary constipation. They can have melina. And what can happen around it, you can get ascites and you can get jaundice. So if you cover up in this manner, get the get try to get localize where the pathology is and then discuss what can happen. Any luminal, any luminal pathology is the best way to get the complete history out. Proximally, locally distally and then around the mass what can happen like it can spread to the wall that we discussed it can get into the, uh, the peritoneal cavity it can hang on to the lung it can go on to the liver so you would not miss anything once you cover this aspect okay and then of course bone distally will be the bone metastasis so that's how you ask the question if you go to the next slide go to the next slide okay one minute just go back what is the role of that homeopathy you know there's one backache and homeopathy medication. So, what do you, what is your interpretation of that? Bimla, <coughs> Bimla. 
Um, Drug-induced gastritis is a possibility. Gastropathy. What's the difference between gastropathy and gastritis? You use the word drug-induced gastritis. What is that? And I'm saying gast drug-induced gastropathy. What's the difference? There'll be no neutrophils. Okay. So in patients with NSA, you don't get neutrophils on histology. So there's a basic difference. So when you say itis, it is inflammatory cell. When you say pathy, then it is more of a uh, a change that occurs, but without neutrophilic infiltration. So, what is your interpretation of this homeopathy and low back ache and the symptom that she has? Can it just can it just be because it's only twenty days, no burning sensation? No burning sensation only for twenty days. So, it could be the recent complaints may be because of that homeopathy. And what she has is much much earlier. She has all those other symptoms. So actually the chief complaint should come first as weight loss and anorexia for six months, burning sensation for 20 days. Always the, the longer the duration that has to be described first and then shorter the duration will come on much later. All right, can you move on to the next slide? So in this particular patient, I would really not go in for polyguria. You think it's a liver disease? Then breathlessness, yes. Any we don't have any, any symptoms okay. saying that she's okay. got a liver disease. Okay. Liver disease, exactly. <clears throat> so she had this some sort of dyspepsia. So we need to really think about it as she presents as a lady who has come with severe uh, weight loss, anorexia, and things. And I'm perfectly okay that we need to think of rule out a luminal cause in this. So there is no history. As Madam said, we need to look for any melina or uh, any GI blood loss. She didn't have any melina. She didn't have any vomiting or hematemesis. And uh, she didn't have any abdominal distension. Abdominal pain, I think, uh, I, I, mean, I only saw this patient in the OPD. She had some vague abdominal pain. It was very, very poorly localized abdominal pain. She was not vomiting. <clears throat> and uh, she did not have any features of a, a, a gastric outlet obstruction. She occasionally said that patient was... Uh, she had some pain in the back. Did you learn? But she has <clears throat> does she does she fulfill room four criteria for uh, dyspepsia? And what type no, would it be? What type? No, ma'am. So symptoms are only for twenty days. Mm, loss of weight and appetite and everything is there for about six months. Suppose you take that. Can it be a post perennial distress syndrome? PPDS. Significant weight loss is unlikely in functions. Yeah, so that's what. That's right. so, so therefore, less likely to be functional. Yeah, it's like because of the severe weight loss. Weight loss. Okay. Can we move on? Yeah, and uh, of course, uh, there was no history of any abdominal pain or vomiting. Okay, this is all the symptoms she had. And uh, anything you want to know about the bubble symptoms here? Steatoria. Anybody wants to know about the bowel symptoms? Is it important to know the bowel symptoms in this patient? Is steatoria? Steatoria, less likely. You need to ask bowel? for an altered bowel habits. Did she have a recent onset of constipation? Okay. Does she have any fatigability? Did she have any melina? Because you know to look off or look out. So this is important. When somebody has, you need to look out. You also please think of a right-sided malignancy, large bowel malignancy, right-sided malignancy where they can come with anoxia, weight loss, all those things. Same time, lady, no hysterectomy. One of the biggest, uh, one of the uh, malignancies which can come with severe ovarian dyspepsia is ovarian malignancy. Ovarian malignancy. Ovarian malignancy. So you need to be, you need to uh, check all these things in this patient. Okay, can we go to the next slide? No, this is okay. Can you go to the next slide, please? Hmm. So she went to another hospital and uh, she was told uh, because she had a pain, she had. Uh, can you can somebody take up this or you want me to? Sir, he diagnosed as chronic liver disease elsewhere, was on tablet Ciplar LA 40 mg twice a day. Labs outside were hemoglobin of 13.4, total count 18,300, platelet count 2.7 lakhs, 
reactant 0.7 and rbs is 126 yeah she went to a local uh, <clears throat> she comes from a, a place called satyamangalam so she went to the hospital was was run by a surgeon and he just did an ultrasound and he was she was told and she was told to have a chronic and she was started on sipla <laughs> yeah can you and these are the reports she had these are the reports uh, she had hemoglobin was 13.4 wbc 18 18300 platelet 2.7 creatinine so he was starting with triplar la dr what's your interpretation of this what operation is this that counts and uh, the diagnosis what do you think of this slide she was found out chronic and put on Ciplar LA 40 BD. Margot? Ma'am, she's having normal hemoglobin. Uh, leuco, uh, uh, like she, leukocytosis is present, but platelet counts are normal. Why do you think they would have started on Ciplar? What, you, start, what is your take? Benoit would start on propanol. He was seen and she was started by Siplar. Somebody has started around Siplar. I think physician or somebody. Siplar. Only as a private prophylaxis. Now, what could have been, uh, or on what basis uh, they would have started on Siplar? When do you start Siplar? Oh, no. I'm usually after doing an endoscopy, we have seen. So, you have a portal hypertension. So, you portal hypertension. Portal hypertension. So, so, portal they would have detected portal hypertension either by endoscopy. Or by, uh, or by ultrasound. See, they would have gone. See, by, she has gone to a local hospital. And they would have diagnosed chronic liver disease only by an mm -hmm. ultrasound, isn't it? They would have done by an ultrasound. In ultrasound, they would have started Ciplar based on the ultrasound report. So, when do you think what ultrasound findings uh, will suggest they would have, would have started on Ciplar? Plenomegaly, aside. Margot, take up yeah. delivery issues. Uh, what basis on ultrasound that. findings will you say or Bargo, what are the ultrasound features of a portal hypertension? Obviously, they have started Ciplar, yes. so they know that there is a portal hypertension. Sir, uh, portal vein will be dilated, splenar vagali will be present. Lilapa, what I am asking you is, if you have done, okay, so what ultrasound, uh, what ultrasound findings could have been there for them to have prompted uh, starting off Ciplar? Uh, yeah, portal vein could have been dilated. Uh, dilated, splina megaly would have been present, and uh, there can be presence of uh, uh, collaterals that can be picked up with. Uh, That's it. So you would have had a splenic vein, splenic collaterals, splenic hilar collaterals. They could have been a dilated portal vein, okay, and they could have uh, have had a yes. splina megaly, okay. Yes. So and this was the reports they they brought saying that thirteen point four WBC was eighteen thousand three hundred platelet was two point seven lakhs. So obviously there was some uh, degree of chronic liver disease and she was started on post on Ciplar based on the thing. I, uh, in that particular place, they would not have done an endoscope. Can I have the next slide? This was the this was the reports they had from outside. So her bilirubin was 0.49, uh, uh, AST was 62, ALT 35, alkene phosphate is 129. Albumin of 3.7, gamma GT of 55. Ultrasound abdomen showing altered coarse echoes of the liver parenchyma with surface irregularities, moderate splenomegaly, minimal ascites, and there is increased parenchymal echogenicity in bilateral kidneys. So, this is the ultrasound which is done outside. Yes. So, what do you think at this point of time? But uh, I don't have a globulin here, so uh, AG ratio. Globulin is 2.9. 2.9 okay. or 3. 2. 9. This is what the reports we had yes. from the hospital which has come to us. Give you an interpretation, Godbert. Interpretation. Just give you an interpretation. Uh, it's cirrhosis of liver with portal hypertension. So she's got uh, moderate spinomegaly. There's a minimal ascites. Minimal ascites is present. Cirrhosis of liver. Albumin is well preserved. Yes. <clears throat> okay. So if she has cirrhosis, 59 years old, with uh, uh, weight loss, what could have been the possibilities at this point of time for her cirrhosis? 59-year-old lady. 
sir uh, viral hepatitis hepatitis b hepatitis c i'll consider and uh, uh, nash related hmm for the weight loss sir is asking for the weight loss weight which loss. is possible but the platelet count is 2.75 come on yes ma'am somebody has got a chronic liver disease come to you with a very severe weight loss uh, uh, minimal asset is present that means she is decompensating i will consider uh, hcc also after yeah. cellular carcinoma so you probably will consider hcc in this patient then uh, you said uh, you said this could be uh hepatitis b hepatitis c nash 60 year old thing i would think of even a possibility of an autoimmune okay yes. yes and i also think of a vascular disease of the liver okay we always consider butchery as one of the differential diagnosis in this liver disease so this is what we have we had when this patient had come to us can we have the uh, next slide so this is our clinical okay. examination yes sir. she was conscious oriented no pyloric plus sinuses clubbing edema or lymphadenopathy uh vitals are uh, stable but heart rate bradycardia is stable she was on uh uh she was on uh, beta blockers in draw yes, so the heart is good or was heart rate was less yes sir her bmi is very low bmi was very low yeah 15.2 she was a frail patient actually she was looking quite frail and she was in pain yes is it uh, how do you interpret the normal platelet count no? there is no pancytopenia no hypersplenism but there is moderate splenomegaly what are the other possibilities that was your mind only thing is she had leukocytosis uh, thrombocytosis can be a acute phase reactant also any other possibility mpn is a possibility MPN. Uh, my my thing is Yes. Can we go to the next one? Next slide. Soft. Abdominal examination. Uh, soft. Liver not palpable. Splenomegaly. But uh, liver span was okay. Let's go. Liver span was normal. Okay. Splenomegaly six centimeters below left costal margin. No free fluid. Bowel sounds are present. Yeah. Any visible abdominal veins? no visible abdominal veins there was no back veins there was not much of ascites but clean was firm and it was 6 cm below the costal margin and soft liver was we were not able to palpate but the span was okay span was normal actually she didn't okay. have anything else so she was non ectric she had a uh, spleen which was palpable anything else you want to check on her in examination sir yeah hepatojugular most importantly any nodes no yes. nodes did she have any axillary nodes she had any this one or uh, any other nodes so uh, nodes are something which we need to look for yes. isn't it yes so something in the splenomegaly here somebody has said there is a chronic liver disease by ultrasound but elsewhere but uh, in your examination you should always include somebody a lady which has got from a weight loss we don't have obvious clinical findings of a chronic liver disease and she's got only a splenomegaly and she you need to always check for nodes yes. be careful okay yes sir how do we know this is not a this is not a non hodgkins lymphoma so you need to look at nodes and when you are general exam sure obviously think think please look at the tonsils and the valdez ring some of the examiners are very very particular of looking at the tonsils so look for the nodes in the neck in uh, neck axilla okay any other notes inguinal notes and then so, so here this patient is soft we are not able to palpate the liver spleen was 6 cm below the costal margin we didn't make out a free fluid much and there was no other neurological deficits but she was a frail and low bmi yes so 
So, so this is the systemic examination we have. So with that ultrasound report and this particular finding, now what is your differential? What is your differential now? Um, I consider uh, uh, cirrhosis with portal hypertension as first differential, mm -hmm. but I also try to keep. Uh, Second possibility? Non serotic portal hypertension. Non serotic intrahepatic. No? Intrahepatic portal hypertension. Can it be EHPVO? Yes, ma'am. EHPVO uh, age is 59, it will present more early and they will usually present with uh, uh, UGI bleed. Even NCPF will present with rectum GI bleed. So here it's only splenomegaly, but you have some information about ultrasound twin cirrhosis. Therefore, EHPVO is unlikely, less likely. No? NCPF yes, can progress to cirrhosis in 20%. Yes, so that is more likely, or it's a de novo cirrhosis, but EHPV progressing to uh, cirrhosis is unlikely or it's not heard of. Okay. So uh, I would shortlist it to cirrhosis, CPA probably compensated. There's minimal ascites, so maybe decompensated. And the second possibility would be a positive for an NCIPH. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, NCIPH. Yeah. Any other questions about CPA? Uh, yeah, I think one can be cirrhosis and uh, another possibility could be, as you said, Madam said, it could be a vascular uh, disease of the liver. And we have a splenomegaly with a, a normal platelet count and high total count. So that's what I think. One, we could think of a cirrhosis, but we should also think of a vascular disease of the liver. That's what I think. Uh, this way. We have no other clue in this. Examination, -wise, there's no notes. And the case for the vascular disease, I think they should have a bit of ascites, no? a significant ascites, which is yeah. not there. If it's a butt carry, you can have an ascites. ascites. As you said, EHPVO, EHPVO they are present. present only with the splenomegaly. Splenomegaly. Can we move on? Spleen is uh, nearly 6 centimeters below the causal margin. Generally, in a cirrhotic livers, you don't get such big spleens. So when your spleen is really out of proportion, then you need to think of an extra hepatic portal hypertension. Can we have next, the next thing? Next slide. Yeah. So current uh, blood investigations, hemoglobin of 13.8, PCV 44, WBC. Can you look at the RBC count? RBC, uh, RBC is uh, 6.36 million. Mm. RBC is 6.36. Then? Yes. PCV is 44.5, WBC is 26,900. Neutrophils of 80%, eosinophils 9.6%, MCV is 45, very low, uh, platelet is 7,28,000 and ESR is 39. What is something that is striking, no? the leukocytosis has always been there in absence of infection, in absence of any other problem, no? so now can you interpret this? Uh, and Petrus Pelpris is showing neutrophilic leukocytosis and thrombocytosis. And thrombocytosis. Yes. Hey, hi, Shobna. Yeah, come on, Bart. Mm. Come Jaldi, on I've been listening for some time. Okay. I think I missed the first 15 minutes. But it's okay, let them carry on. I was just looking at the... Uh, all three cell lines are elevated. Yeah. Uh, mm. We'll have to introduce a lot more differential diagnosis. Maybe he can talk about that. Yeah, Bart. So all the cell uh, lines are increased. So RBC count is increased, WBC is count. And sir, I I will only consider uh, myeloproliferative neoplasm. Myeloproliferative neoplasm as one of the wrong possibilities. Yeah. Okay. How would that cause portal hypertension and cirrhosis? MPN can cause. Uh, uh, it's a pro uh, pro thrombotic phenomenon, so it can cause uh, thrombosis and. Uh, it will cause uh, uh, extra hepatic portal hypertension. It can also cause occlusion of the hepatic vein or outflow system. That side also. It can yeah. cause yeah. Like obstruction or a portal vein obstruction. Yeah, it, it can cause portal mesenteric thrombosis. Yes. It can also come like an obliterative venopathy if it comes as a chronic, uh, uh, chronic thing, or it can be a, a, a come as a BCS, but carry syndrome. Okay, these three things will be. so. 
you can get non serotic portal vein thrombosis ncpvt you can get bcs and if it is going to be presenting for a period of time even sometimes obliterative venopathies like yes. ncph you can also consider uh, uh iloproliferase syndromes in these patients so this is significant you have all the three yes sir Okay, what's the next investigation you want? Ma'am, in this patient, uh, uh, I would like to go for a ECT abdomen with triple phase. Any other, any other investigation with this blood counts? <laughs> with this MPN, what will be your first level investigation? Jack two mutation. Yeah, uh, you can go for a Jack two. No, you finish off the blood test. Go for a jack tool. Go then, to the next uh, next slide, please. You'll we'll see what then, the, then, Okay, continue. This total will remain is 0. 0.6, direct of 0. 0.3. AC is 41, ALT 27, total protein of 7.9, albumin 4.1, globulin 3.8, gamma GT 62, alkaline phosphatase 195, urea of 20, creat of 0. 0.7, sodium potassium normal. Normal. So most of the things will look very normal here. Yeah. LFT normal. Oh, yeah, even ALP was mildly elevated. Our thing was around 139 is normal. ALP is mildly elevated. Yes. But your yes. liver function tests were fairly all right. There was no AG reversal. <laughs> and uh, only the AST was more than ALP. Margal, in a patient who has got this type of a presentation in CIPH was EHPU with a rise in IPOS and gamma GT, what is their thought process? A portal cavernoma cholangiopathy. Okay. Good. So it can be. So that you have to keep in mind. Patient is asymptomatic otherwise, but rise in alpha and gamma GT will keep the positive of PCC. Yeah? Okay. okay. Next slide. Viral serology, HBSAG, anti HCV, HIV are negative. So we just did this and uh, we didn't really go for because the CB, we didn't really check for autoimmune profile because basically uh, uh, it looked as if there's all the three cell lines were increased. And she had a splenomegaly. So, what is the next imaging you would like to do? We had an ultrasound done elsewhere, which said just surface nodularity of the liver and a mild ascites and splenomegaly. Yes. Can we have the next slide? What do you want next? I would like to do a CCT abdomen. Can you do the next slide, please? Yeah, this is okay. We did B12 mainly, we were thinking of polycythemia vera. So, B12, uh, this was a normal, TSH was pretty normal. Okay. Next slide, please. Yeah. Sir, uh, this is an image of uh, contrast CT mm -hmm. showing a normal size liver. Is it? What face is it? What is uh, what arterial? Arterial. Yeah, it's an arterial. Face. arterial face and. Yeah. Uh, Second one is a venous or a yeah. venous phase. Late venous phase. And what do you see? What do you Late see in the phase. liver? What do you see in the spleen? Sir, uh, liver size looks normal. Yeah. So, uh, when... One thing, just a minute. You cannot comment, do not comment on sizes of liver or dissection of the GI. There is only one plate that is given to you. Because yes. you have to hold uh, the size of the liver down to the bottom. What you have got is only two films. Two films. That do not on size of the liver. Yes, ma'am. What do you see here that is very striking? Ma'am, uh, massive splenomegaly is there. And I can see some collaterals. And look at it. Look at the the liver. Ma'am, uh, there is a difference of attenuation. Correct. Can we uh, THAD? What did you expand? You have to expand that. What you said? Transhepatic attenuation difference. Transhepatic attenuation due to a perfusion. Uh, uh, differential uh, perfusion. Different. There's a perfusion. Uh, yes. Yes. And you see a large uh, spleen. Yes. You can't really trace out the portal vein. Of course, I should give you more uh, slides on the next time. I think I'll try to get you a dynamic fill so that you can put the dynamic fill and see it. 
there is there's not much of ascites or anything in this thing. So can we do that? Can we go to the next slide? CT abdomen, mild surface irregularity of the liver to rule out liver parenchymal disease. Hepatic veins are uh, small in caliber. Complete thrombosis of portal vein and its branches. Clinic vein and SMB are and the partial thrombosis of SMB branches. Moderate, severely enlarged spleen with wet shaped sensing hypodense areas, likely is clinic infects. What, what, what is the classification now? This portal vein venous system thrombosis. Latest classification we fall into which type? Right now, previously we used to call a Dell class. No, no, Dell is still known. Dell, what is current, current classification? Serine classification. Yeah, abbeys, no? Serine, abbey and serine. So what is it? Yeah. What, what, what category will this be? What type will be? From most of the portal vein, branches, pendic vein, and it is four, no? Type four. Yes, ma'am. Type, type four. Type four. All are, all are blocked. So it's a complete yes. blockage of all the vessels. That's right. why I said, in your differentials, see, you, uh, if you, had, you should have considered the HPDO there. No? It is just a normal, near normal liver with this splenomegaly. Therefore, one of the DDs for that, that, for that type of a presentation with no veins in the anterior abdominal wall, there are only two DDs. One is EHPDO, the other one is NCIPH. In NCIPH, yet you can get veins. But if there's no vein, in NCIPH will come as a second DD for an EHPDO. Had you thought of that there, you're comfortable here, no? It's added to your diagnosis, so I'm not surprised. So and you also had a prothrombotic state. The other uh, classification, uh, you look at this uh, portal vein thrombosis, you look at the site. Uh, is it uh, type 1 is only trunk, type yeah. 2 is uh, branch only. Type three will be trunk and branches. Trunk and branches. Then okay. you go to the degree of uh, degree of portal venous system occlusion. Is it yeah. occlusive, non-occlusive? Then you look at the duration. Is it recent, duration. chronic, or asymptomatic? Then you see the extent. Is it involving only the portal vein, splenic vein, mesenteric vein, or both? Combination. Both. Then is it cirrhotic, yeah. non-cirrhotic, post liver transplant, or local malignancy? So when you look at it, so the, one of the reasons why we look at the CT is we are costly suspecting a malignancy. So there's no obvious malignancy in this. So she has got a portal vein thrombosis. My question here is, is this, uh, you think is a recent or a chronic portal vein thrombosis? Yes. Yeah. Is it recent or chronic? Sir, uh, they didn't mention any collaterals in this report. But, uh, based if it is on a collateral recent thrombosis, we need to know whether it's hyperdense or not hyperdense. So the recent this recent thrombus will be hyperdense. Chronic hyperdense will not be hyperdense and they'll always be collaterals. Yes. Okay. So here it's a recent portal vein thrombosis. It looks as if it was not very uh, it, it, it was a little hyperdense, but we did not see any collaterals anywhere. We didn't have any ascites. Okay. Yes, sir. she's been having yes. some vague pain for the last 20 days. Yes. So how do you explain splenomegaly? <clears throat> Underlying yeah. myeloproliferative neoplasia. <laughs> Excellent. Very good. So if you have a recent portal vein thrombus splenomegaly, you should always suspect uh, so she has been having undetected splenomegaly going for a long time with a myeloproliferative syndrome. And this Pain she brought us for the brought you to the doctor was possibly due to recent complete growth on the portal vein and branches. Okay, and the yeah. fact you look at the number of infarcts she had in the spleen would also be suggesting of a, a recent thrombosis. So, which is saying, and uh, mild surface regularity of the liver, but she has no other features of any chronic liver disease. So, if you have a portal vein thrombosis without a splenomegaly, but, but if it is, this is a splenomegaly, is the onset of portal vein thrombosis. And so here in this patient, you have leukocytosis, you have thrombocytosis, you have polycythemia. Of course, the PCV does not correlate with the thing. But here you can see that there's a large spleen and a recent portal vein thrombosis. So what do you do next? Yes. Sir, uh, we can do a jack mutation analysis and can go ahead with bone marrow. Bone marrow. Bone marrow. Can you have the next slide? We did an endoscopy, of course, because is it a chronic portal vein thrombosis or something? There were no, there were no varices. Okay. Next, please. Yes. Next, please. Next slide. Yeah. Can you go to the next, please? 
So, Barga, when can you, how early can you get a thrombosis in a patient with uh, uh, varices in a patient with cotonic thrombosis? How early? I'm two sorry, weeks, okay? Two weeks. Sorry. Two weeks. So, within two weeks, you know, so even if you have an alcoholic hepatitis, anything that's acute, within two weeks, you can still get varices. So, absence of that. So, that is important, okay? That type of patient there. Okay. Bone marrow. So, bone, bone marrow section. Section. Section shows uh, bro uh, bony trabeculae enclosing 7 to 9 hypercellular marrow spaces, erythroid series normal and shows predominantly normoblastic maturation. The myeloid series adequate and shows sequential maturation. Megakaryocytes markedly increased and many with hypersegmented nuclei also arranged in loose clusters. Reticulin stain predominantly grade 1 fibrosis and focal areas of grade 2 fibrosis. European Next. concerns on bone marrow, grading of fibers. Next slide. So, hypercellular marrow with marked megakaryocytic hyperplasia. Registered mm -hmm. cyto, uh, cytogenetic studies and JAK2 cal reticulin MPL mutational studies yeah. subtype the myeloproliferative neoplasia. So, that, so that megakaryocytic, no? See, right at the beginning, you found the 2.75. So just a simple, few simple uh, dictums, you know, in liver disease. If you have a liver disease, usually 99% of your always find less than 1.5. Once it is 1.5 and above, and still you have a diagnosis of portal hypertension, you have some diagnosis of cirrhosis, start thinking in terms of an NPN. I think you will always be in the right direction there. So, and see how it fits in, no? It's, so, you have 2.75, we have thrombocytosis and a bone marrow again is coming out with a so suggestion of a JAK2. Okay. So, which one of these we will do first? JAK2, calroticlin or NPL mutations? Yeah, which one did you do first? The JAK2 will do first. Jack2 first. first is, test is JAK2 mutation. Can we have the next slide? So, JAK2 everything was positive. So, here this is a patient who had a myeloproliferative syndrome probably going on for a long time. She had an incidental splenomegaly, but abdominal pain for about 20, nearly 20 days, not able to eat and back pain, splenomegaly. There was no significant evidence of chronic liver disease. And uh, she had, the pain was because of recent uh, portal vein thrombosis. So what will be your final diagnosis in this patient? Uh, final diagnosis will be uh, Myeloproliferative neoplasia, acute portal vein. Myeloproliferative syndrome with grade 1 myelofibrosis. She's already gone into fibrosis. Grade 1 myelofibrosis. Number and 2. Acute, uh, acute portal vein thrombosis. No, oh, should, you should. Uh, what are the. Why is the CT important in this? Just to pick up, you want to look at only the portal vein thrombosis. What else you want to look at? What has CT ruled out in this patients? Another way the question is that. Sir, cirrhosis of liver. No, I mean, see, here we don't have obvious cirrhosis, but she has got a portal vein thrombosis, SMV and splenic vein thrombosis. She has got a non-tumoral. So, important thing is, in any portal vein thrombosis, please look for local pathology. 30% of the times you'll have a local pathology. You yes. may have an intestinal uh, diverticulitis, you have an appendicitis, you'll have a malignancy or anything. Okay. So, you have to look for it. That is the importance of doing a CT scan. CT also will look out for it. So, any portal vein thrombosis, apart from your acquired conditions or uh, your uh, myeloproliferative neoplasms, you need our inherited conditions, you always have to look for this one. So, there is, so the of our final diagnosis will be myeloproliferative disorder, myelofibrosis grade 1. She has got non tumoral, non serotic portal vein thrombosis okay recent thrombosis no portal hypertension it has uh, it has involved portal vein superior mesonic splenic vein with a jack 2 positive so, this, uh, so she does not have any evidence of a chronic non serotic pvt or portal cholangiopathy yes these are things you should uh, you should this should be our diagnosis so, yes. Doctor, we also have to add that we had, uh, we had splenic infarct. Splenic infarct, yes. Yeah, and uh, yeah, yes. the only thing that is not is so she's got multiple abdominal vein thrombosis. That's the best way to put it. With 
मैडम हेलो यस मैडम मल्टीपल वीनस इन द बैकग्राउंड ऑफ अ नॉर्मल लिवर Yes. Yeah. So the only thing is the hepatic veins uh, to evaluate these sometimes an MR venogram more than just a plain C C T scan. So would you do that? Doppler study, you mean? Doppler study? Sure. Because hepatic veins were also attenuated, so I think uh, probably can just do a Doppler study as well to ensure whether the Output system is also affected or normal. If you are asked, what will be the first uh, radiological imaging? You should be asked. Choice. Sound Doppler and Doppler. Doppler. Doppler study. So this we did this. How will so, you manage Barber? Hmm. What is the role of anticoagulants? Just before you go to management, what are okay. the just a theoretical concern? What are the other conditions you would like to rule out when you pay when you, when you have a non-serotic non-portal uh, non-serotic non-tumoral portal vein thrombosis? Supposing Jack two is negative, what are the other things we look for? Sir, uh, we can do Cal reticulum. Cal reticulum, yes. which is will be positive in about fifteen percent of times. You can look for. What are the other things you look for? Sir, other things. Uh, EP, TPM. Supposing this lady is a. You see, she is about twenty-eight year old lady. Yes, sir. Uh, other prothrombotic workup, which includes protein C S deficiency, factor V lead. Supposing a twenty-eight year old lady comes. Recently married. Oral contraception. Oral, oral contraception. Very very important. You ask for the history of oral contraceptives. Okay. Yes. So what are the other uh, conditions you look for? Aplas. Pila prod is Jack two. Aplas. Yeah. Uh, look for antiphospholipid syndrome and paroxysmal. PNH. PNH. How do you look at PNH? What is that? Thing? What is the CD fifty five assay? You need to look for that PNH. Okay. So kindly read up the whole thing of uh, inherited factors both in but but carry syndrome and non serotic portal vein thrombosis. Okay. So you can just classify the portal vein thrombosis as hypercoagulable state and myelin proliferator. In hypercoagulation, you have all the conditions that you mentioned. Drugs and low. And then, yeah, and then class one once again as acquired and hereditary. So once you have the hereditary and acquired, then you have the acquired causes as uh, you know the PNH, homocysteinemia. Then you have the APLA, and then you have the MT, the methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. All these are acquired. And on the other side of the hereditary disorder would be protein C S anti-promontory, and then you have the Uh, uh, Prothrombin, uh, so anti-promontory. Yeah, those are the important. Um, uh, this factor five laden. All this will be hereditary. So always, when you answer, classify it. Classify it as hereditary, congenital, and acquired. Okay. So how should you manage this patient? Barker has disappeared. How, how do you manage this patient? Good one. Ma'am, uh, we would, hello. Yeah, Ma'am, we would want to, because of the uh, acute, uh, uh, acute thrombosis, we would want to coag anticoagulate the patient. Ma'am, uh, we yes, would so want how, to. How do you do it? Just you have to tell how do you do it. No? Ma'am, LNWH, uh, we would give. Uh, I think there's some problem with the internet. Hmm. Any? So uh, this patient, first of all, I think we should go for an anticoagulation. So you can do an anticoagulation on this. So how do you initiate anticoagulation on this? Anybody can take it up. In a low molecular weight heparin with the warfarin, ma'am. Then you can follow it up with. With the ina, sir. No, no, anti. No, you're going to use uh, low molecular weight heparin. After that. Epic. What do you use? APT, this sir. No, no. What, what, what will be the treatment uh, pattern, pattern strategy in this? Hmm. 
one is uh, you start with uh, with a low molecular weight heparin or heparin and then with warfarin sir with warfarin yeah with warfarin so this is one thing which you can do if he has come with an acute portal vein thrombosis you can also attempt a thrombolysis okay sir you can attempt a thrombolysis how do you how do you estimate how do you estimate the assessor how do you estimate the loss of uh, uh, blood what percentage of blood based on the thrombus if you if the thrombus occupies 50% the perfusion comes down by 50 and 25% of that 50% okay yes, it changes at again yes, no, if you if you, you see the portal vein is a very rigid tube yes. the blood flow decreases proportionately so if it is 80% or 50% is the thrombus occupies that portal vein then it will be it will be 50 plus 25% of that 50% so that means it will come down by about 67 62 or 63% so that's how you estimate the thing loss so if sometimes what happens is it is very acute they may they get in instead of anticoagulant they may combine it with a thrombolysis and then start the patients on anticoagulants okay you can okay. it's only portal vein you can even do an angioplasty Put a thing and then do it. If it's acute portal vein thrombosis, of course, chronic portal vein thrombosis or uh, normal, we don't do this, right? Any other questions? Then, uh, on this? then uh, what is that? So you give warfarin. Is there any role for direct acting coagulants, anticoagulants in these patients? Answer. Yeah. 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 Yeah
non serotic portal vein thrombosis. That's what they're, that's where they've given you the classical nomenclature of portal vein thrombosis. The types is it recent, this thing, or asymptomatic, all those things we need to do. And please look at what are the inherited conditions. Most importantly, you should always, always look, look at the lo local conditions. Local conditions. So when you do a CT, it is not only you are looking at the myelofibrosis or inherited thrombophilias. You should also look for diverticulitis, appendicitis, portal pyemias, any other malignancies. malignancies. <coughs> and uh, there was a recent question on malignant procoagulant state. Kindly read about this malignant procoagulant state. What really, what really uh, pushes the abdominal malignancies? Uh, why do people malignant procoagulant state? Okay, the, it, it actually when you look at the thrombus. And you take those thrombus and look at the oncogenes in the thrombus. The same oncogenes which have produced malignancy will be there in this particular thrombus. That is the classical point of sight. And there are what is called as shedding of procoagulant microvesicles in the malignancies, pro microvesicles, which will cause this thrombosis. Kindly read about it because this um, malignant procoagulant state has been a short notes in one of this, uh, I think, uh, Rajiv Gandhi University, one of the short cases okay okay thank uh, you uh, Purva, you have can we take the Purva's case can we take or you have a second case can we you yeah, want, I have yeah. seen, any other cases there ma'am uh, you want to present your case ma'am i present my case yeah you present dr lvk will take up the discussion and Benina and harish you can take up for discussion along with all three of you yes ma'am Uh, uh, minute, you, you will be one. Uh, I think, uh, Benila, you can take up the case. Just start. Just start. Ma'am, shall I? Yeah, please, please, yeah. Uh, Mr. Ennis, 30 year old male, resident of Pandiwali, businessman by occupation, history given by the patient himself. Admitted in Global Hospital since 27-6-22 with complaints of yellowish discoloration of eyes and urine since one month, abdominal distension and pedal edema since 20 days, and altered sleep pattern since 10 days. Yeah. What are the questions you would like to know? LBK, please take up this case. Yeah. One more. Uh, about the yellowish discoloration of eyes and urine, it's a normal distension for 20 days, alter sleep pattern for since 10 days. Yeah, okay. About the jaundice, I would like to know about the uh, onset and progression of jaundice. Any qualitative features like purities, clay colored stool, etc., it associated with the uh, prodromal symptoms or like prodromal symptoms and uh, history of any uh, drug or CAM intake, or uh, hystrophony alcohol intake. So you want to know uh, uh, the, the onset of jaundice, was it associated with the prodromal symptoms? <clears throat> Did you have any cholestative features? <clears throat> uh, and uh, there was abdominal, okay. Any other things are there, Dr. Purva? Um, sir, um, the one minute, let us just finish. So, what are the things you want for abdominal distension and edema legs? And then we'll go to the next slide. Mm. Uh, about the onset and progression of abdominal distension, any pain mm. is there? Mm. Then. Mm. What's the first thing that you'll ask any patient with abdominal distension and edema legs? It's a localized or generalized, ma'am? Oliguria. 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 But that's the first thing, you know. In fact, the first okay. symptom okay. of a chronic liver disease with decompensation is reduced urine output. If you take a very good history, 
the first thing that the first thing in that RAS system that takes place in the pathophysiology, the first thing that happens is a reduction in the urine output. So any patient coming with, supposing a person is ascites and normal urine output, you can almost be certain that is output measured. You can almost be certain that it is unlikely or less likely to be a cirrhotic liver. Okay, so that, that's the first question, you know, like if, if malignant ascites, the urine output will be good, tuberculous ascites, it will be normal, outflow tract obstruction, but caries, it will be normal because the liver still is normal. So the first, so when you get a case with abdominal dysentery, you give my leg, the first, next question is how is your urine output? And that's when you start considering, you know, urine output normal, your diagnosis, it is a, it's a very nice one, one question that gives you a lead to what is the possibility. It's not the frequency. You may say I passed 10 times, but we are asking about the quantification. All right? So abdominal distinction, you said, pain, you said, then you mentioned about the urine output. I think that should be sufficient for the initial go. And then there's an altered sleep pattern for 10 days. So now, now take one of the other questions that you would ask. Any history of GA bleed, like uh, yeah. hematemesis or malina? Then? Uh, any... A history of uh, suggestion of infections like fever, cough. Uh, so you're asking for the like precipitating factors. Precipitating factors for hepatic encephalopathy. Encephalopathy, okay. And then what else would you ask? One is respiratory factors, which could be drugs, it could be sepsis, it could be a GIB, okay, it can be an SBP. And then what, what's the next question that you would ask? So once you've got a respiratory, what are the types? So, so keep the HE classification. It's a uh, overt or covert. Yeah, so keep that in mind. In that in that context, you'll ask the questions. No? Uh, uh, and grading, uh, uh, history, to suggest the grading of hepatic encephalopathy, how uh, it's a coma or it's a somnolence? Or... Yeah, no, he has got no, only altered sleep pattern. No? Oh, okay. uh, so, but you have to ask whether he's got a state of stupor state, whether he's aggressive, whether he's violent, or was he like that and now he's come back to this stage. So that will give you whether it's a problem, what's its stage. Grading of encephalopathy is possible with the history taking. So frustrating factors. And then what's the other thing? What's the next column in HE? Episodic, intermittent, or continuous. Or, uh, continuous. So that will also give you a clue. If it's the first time, then it's the first time. But if it's recurrent episodes and there's a history in the past, then it becomes almost a chronic liver disease. Chronic liver disease. Uh, collaterals. With collaterals, it's almost... It tells you, gives, gives you a proof of the diagnosis. So always when, see, in, 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 in any of the cirrhotic patients, so once you have that one complication, ultimately cirrhosis is only expansion of each of the complications. So for HE, you have the table, get all the questions out. For medicine bleed, you have questions, get all the questions out. So there are about eight complications of cirrhosis. For each of the complication, have your set of questions. Okay. So no medicine bleed, finish it. that finishes off the medicine bleed. Okay. What's the next uh, urine output? A uh, urine output can be AKI. Or it, can, it can be uh, okay. so urine output is most important. Okay, ma'am. And bleeding tendency, breathlessness. Keep each of the complications. So what I usually how I teach is you know you just keep the liver in the center. Above the liver you have the varices and portal hypertensive and gastropathy. Okay, that mm -hmm. finishes that. Then you come to the abdomen compartment. You have ascites, SBP, refractory ascites. Only three there. Come yes. down to the kidney. You can have AKI and you can have a hepatic uh, adrenocortical insufficiency. So that finishes that. Then you come to the liver. Liver, you can have jaundice, you can have coagulopathy, and you can have, you can have HCC, HCC. HCC. Now move above the liver. You can have breathlessness, yeah. hydrothorax, which can be photopulmonary or it can be hepatopulmonary. Then go to the heart. You can have cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, you can have alcoholic cardiomyopathy. Then you go up to the brain. You can have mm -hmm. HE. And you can encephalopathy and MHE. Then go to the whole body, sepsis. That's it. And hemodynamic instability and dyselectrolemia. So you just see, if you count, there are only about 10 complications, you know. So when you get a case of chronic liver disease, just focus your attention to the liver first and see what happens above, what happens in the center, what happens with the liver, and just go up and down, go to the heart and go to the brain and go to the general. And a GA bleed. Yeah, so you know everything will just fit in as a jigsaw puzzle, and you'll be able to make a perfect diagnosis. Of all. Ultimately, it's only managing the complications in the cirrhotic. Okay. okay, okay. Can we move on? Because I think she'll have an expansion. Okay, just read it out. Question was uh, apparently normal till one month back. Uh, 
and when he developed jaundice in the form of Eloge discoloration of hives, which was insidious in onset associated with Eloge discoloration of urine. It was progressive in nature, gradually spreading to palms and soles over a period of 8 to 10 days. It was associated with anorexia and AC fatigability with approximate 50% decrease in the appetite from previous. Not associated with the puritis, clay colored stools, or prodrome. He did not take any medication for this. Since 20 days, patient complains of insidious onset of abdominal distension, which was gradually progressive, bilaterally symmetrical, and associated with the feeling of tightness of clothes and weight gain. So here, there is a progressive jaundice uh, with anoxia, easy fatigability, which is going on for 20, uh, 8 to 10 days. And now he has developed the onset of abdominal distension and edema. So what your what is your take on this? You have some more history, Then move on. Next slide. This was associated with pain in the right upper abdomen, which was insidious, dull aching in nature, mild to moderate in intensity, increased postprandially. It was followed by swelling of one minute. Just, just, just hold on. Which type of pain in this particular patient? Located to the right upper quadrant will increase with cold after a meal. Purva, why did you get that? What What is your lady there? Ma'am, uh, he could have a, a hepatomegaly, uh, some organo, likely a hepatomegaly which is causing stretching, especially. No, but in you, the, said, you said it increases post prandial. That's a wrong statement there. Okay. Yeah, you understand. Post prandial increase in pain in the right upper quadrant will be a DU or a GU. Yes. No? Yeah, it will not be a liver enlargement. That's why I asked the question. Okay, then. Followed by swelling in bilateral, progressive. Lower limb, which was insidious, bilaterally symmetrical, hmm. progressing up to angle, not associated with redness or discoloration or discharge. Hmm. For these complaints, patient was initially taking treatment. No, I, I just stop here. Now, see, don't be in a hurry to go to the local doctor. Leave that local doctor alone. The family physician, just leave him alone. You have not completed the history, you no, know, of oliguria, most important history. Yes. On the other hand, the family doctor is given the diuretic and you're coming out with that information that the urine output has improved. Purma, are you understanding? Yes, sir. Yeah, so never ever be in a hurry to go to what happened with the local physician. You try to get an assessment of the case and then you take a call and see whether the family physician's information like the previous case helps you. Like the previous case we kept on discussing as upper GI malignancy and all. But that ultrasound gave us a clue that now we were heading towards liver. You understood? Yes, sir. Yeah, so don't be in a hurry with that family doctor. The family doctor can be right. Like he started on Ciparelli and the physician treating would be have goddess got misguided that it is EHP or NCIPH. Understand? So if it helps you, you can add on, but much, much later. You see, in your own history taking, important, you have to exclude GIB. Look out for the AKI, see whether the kidneys have been involved, see whether there's any bleeding tendency. All that has to come up. HE has not been expanded. So, no, uh, LBK, I think, you know, that yeah. history. HE yeah, is expandable, oliguria, abdominal yeah. pain. pain. Exactly. All these all things. Those things. Anoroxia, hmm. all those things need to be expanded. expanded. Hmm. Move on to the next slide. Hmm. As per the patient, uh, what, what, is, what is missing in this case? We have not got any history of alcohol. We have not got any information. Now, you cannot tell in personal history. All that I said is in a background of alcoholism. It goes for a crash. Because here we are trying like a Sherlock Holmes. So we are trying to pick out why he's got jaundice. But if he's consuming alcohol, you can't come, come out with that. Or at least say he's not been consuming alcohol. Then our DD gets shortlisted. Alcohol is not there. Cam is not there. Then left alone is only a B and C virus. That's it. Ma'am, actually, I had mentioned in the personal history, ma'am. Ma ah, that's why. That's why. That's why. You know, because in your in your PG clinics, you mentioned it's a case of alcohol use disorder. So I knew it was an alcohol-related liver disease, and still alcohol history has not come. Yes, Are you understanding? Now, yes, LBK, just highlight on this important. This so this is very important. You cannot keep the examiner guessing. Jaundice has come, it has disappeared. No, SIP, it is the saving you know. And then towards the end, you say, oh, he's an alcohol. He consumes alcohol. Uh, only about the thing is a patient who has now come with jaundice, which is gradually progressing. We have gone on in 20 days' time for yeah. sleep and edema. 
very very difficult for the jaundice to recede in four to five days exactly yeah. okay see already we know that this patient has got chronic liver disease some and there is something like pro progression like an aclf yeah so we know uh, we should know what is it what is it is he taking alcohol or something yeah. the right upper quadrant pain that ac that uh, sort of ascites progressive jaundice feeling of sickness mm -hmm. so be uh, if you don't if you this statement does not fit in with your case don't tell all these things okay. like sir sir it was only documented on I'll tell you. and then i can take you saying let like, tell me cases where patients or jaundice disappear in 4 to 5 days exactly exactly we don't this does not fit in at all you don't expect a patient who has had jaundice going on for i think progressively in 20 days time or 30 days time having developing bilateral pdm and ascites anorexia and the jaundice will not regress he will tell something but don't put it mm. okay yes so i think you should, you can bring in alcohol much earlier than uh, much much earlier yeah in the it should be mentioned in the chief complaint itself one or like uh, no, 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 no when, you start, when you when you start with the history you will say the history itself i think you can just start off yeah. because you were keeping us guessing think no? everything is fitting into an yeah. alcohol this there's no you can start off you can start patient okay. patient okay. is uh, has don't say alcoholic patient is, is a patient who's been consuming alcohol for these many years at the recent history of increase in intake with this background he came with this and then you say this risk of prodromal symptoms or any other cam intake so that that covers up those two we have three you know three important conditions ahead of the joint this three important rest are all there prodromal symptoms is one alcohol is one drug induced liver injury are the three important causes so he, so here his patient has come with a progressive jaundice decompensation Given he had encephalopathy, given given diuretics, discharge. Now he has come back again with encephalopathy and worsening jaundice. But what happened to his ascites? His jaundice has come down, but our main problem was ascites, and he didn't manage. What happened to that? Good one. Then, uh, that is, uh, he was on medication for that, but it was not. Uh, Much resolved. The abdominal distension was still persisting. So I, I, I just cut short this. See what has happened. About a week later, again, what is John? This that means it's not disappeared. So don't make, don't, don't care about the history to such an extent. Just say that there was some response and he was discharged, but came with worsening of symptoms within the next few days. Yeah. Don't tear about the history in such a way that something has appeared and completely disappeared. How can John just disappear? A site is maybe more like you may know. And within four days, he again gets John just. You understand. You understand yes, what we are trying to convey. Yes, His, yes, history yes. has to be just molded like a story. Yes. Sir. Like the previous case, sir, brought out so nice. You know what? This was a postprandial, and then incidentally something came up, cropped up, and then we moved on towards what cropped up. But history has to be discussed. Well, it's okay. So I don't think this is thing, and because uh, don't get into these. Yeah. This, If you think that history is not fitting into the realm of your diagnosis, mm -hmm. and it's not very important, please don't mention this. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And okay. other other important thing, don't mention any hospital names. Okay, no hospital okay. names, no hospital names, no names of doctors, nothing. Patient was came back to the hospital. That's all. That's Next slide. Go on. Next slide. Go on. All this in global hospital. Patient was diagnostic tests. All this. Okay, just read on quickly. And uh, there's no history of hematemesis, melina, hematopoiesis could have come much, much earlier. Much earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, as Madam was telling, no history of degenerative facial periorbital and PND all could have come in much into the into the family into the history, into your history. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you say that, that, and then you don't need to think what has happened earlier and this thing. So if you think there is a chronic liver disease with an ACL, all okay, these things the come up into the present history much earlier. You don't need to wait that he has come to global hospital to find out all these things. So in, a, in your examination, we are presenting. As Madam said, finish off GI bleed, finish off encephalopathy, finish off cholestatic symptoms, fertility, finish, finish off anorexia. Then all his oral ulcer, generalized body ache, facial puffing up, the cardiac symptoms, neurological symptoms in the present illness. Present illness, okay. And this, um, then you can finish off this and then give you the course of the illness, okay? Yeah, and uh, this orthodeoxia, no history of orthodeoxia, no one is by investigation, no, while you are doing the examination. Patient will not complain of orthodeoxia. Okay, 
and then CT scan was done, managed conservatively. It is, it is, it is actually it's not giving us any extra information. So all that will come for all the surgical problems. No, no. You just say for all these issues, patient was had some basic blood tests and also had high end imaging, including an endoscopy. Details of which are not known to him. What's known to him? Then he tells it's known to him. So, so these histories should come there, and yeah. uh, after you finish all the presenting uh, history. Then in your course of the pre or the treatment history, you can mention that he has come to global hospital. He was investigated by CT and told so and so. He was done an yeah. endoscopy and said he had things. Exactly. And asked if he has undergone any intervention or not. So this you finish, you bring it to them to the treatment history. That's why LVK from next year onwards, let the PGs take their own case and present. Then only we know, no, here we are showing the history, so it's it's easy cake work for them. But this, sure. this, this way we, they will learn how to present. Okay, move on. Next slide. No, it's your fever, rash, abdominal pain. Or See, all these so things. Could all have this is all into the in much earlier into the history. And this one, no, no history of any travel outside food or water exposure. And all. how can you? The Bombay has full of rains. Yeah, all you say or water exposure. We get all thinking, sewage contamination. You... Yeah, be very careful with all those statements. No history of any travel outside food or water exposure. All these are irrelevant. You want to suspect HEV or HAV? You, you, you get a prodromal, no? You yes, get your prodromal no symptoms. That's it. If it's leptospirosis, you get your body ache. Whatever is crossing your mind. Okay, so don't bring in this no issue of any travel. You know, I'll tell you what. And we can all, all of us, we're all mind examiners. But otherwise, they will say travel where, doctor. If it goes by bus, is it travel or not? You know? And then you'll have a setback. You'll not know what to answer. Yes, ma'am. I'm telling you the truth that really takes place. Okay, this is what suppose you say no is to travel. They say, doctor, he goes out, he goes to the shop next day in a bus. Is it a travel or not? It is a travel. Okay. Did, and don't don't use the word denies. This when you say denies, you, you feel that you want it to happen. It's not like that. When you say he denies history of whatever you want the high sexual behavior, you, it is not a denial. You just say there's no history. That's it. Despite him saying no, there will still be a history. They were not disclosure. Yeah. Poor, poor scholastic performance in childhood. Uh, does it really apply here? So in this patient, get, exactly. Yeah, it does not apply here. Then you get poor score. What do you think if it is? See, it will unnecessarily get you off into another thing. Then they'll say, uh, uh, then you can, you may, I might ask you, name the jaundice in childhood. What are the childhood disorders we cannot use? Yeah, they will just do See, all this is not needed. See, we know we are tackling with somebody, some alcohol liver disease or whatever it is. No, we've still not Take got the information. Okay. We've, still, we've still not got the information of alcohol. No. You understand? Okay, no, next yes, slide. Yes, yeah. Improve on your history. Next slide. Yes. Known case of? Angulosing spondylosis diagnosed since three to four years, for which he was kept on tap naproxen, but he defaulted the treatment on his own after one to two months. He reports occasional early morning back stiffness, which is which improves spontaneously. Okay, they're not really relevant to this case, but you can mention it. Okay, next slide. Yeah. First yeah. history. Ma make chronic. it brief, make it brief. So first history, chronic alcohol. Don't use the word alcoholic, it's a taboo. Okay. You say chronic alcoholism or alcohol. We don't disorder. use the word chronic alcoholic. No we don't alcoholic. use a patient with a known alcohol use it's disorder. disorder. Yeah. Hmm. Consumes around 240 ml of whiskey thrice Fine, per that's week. okay. So, you want the alcohol history, they make it brief. Alcohol age. history is there, age criteria is there. Hmm. And don't use the word pure vegetarian at all. Just say he's vegetarian. Uh, when, you are, when, you are, uh, when you are doing alcohol, just ask him what, when was the last drink. Last drink. That is very important. So, Binge. you want to define alcoholic hepatitis and all, you should know when is the last drink in this patient. Okay? And, and binge drink. That's the most important for the alcohol history. And appetite, don't use the word pure vegetarian and all. Just say, this is he's a sedentary worker, he's a manual worker, whatever. Requirement is so much, he's deficient in calorie and protein by so much. Finished. That's it. Okay. And there are examiners who will ask you, how do you calculate? So, advice to all the PGs who are appearing next month. Mm -hmm. Just see that people from north have some idea of diet from the south. South is usually the same. And then have some information of the south people moving to north. For the you know a normal chapati, they ask one roti, small size roti. What will what will be the calorie? What will be the protein? One egg? What will be the this thing? 
So they'll ask you how you calculate it. So be very careful. Have a typical diet of a South Indian. Have a typical diet for North and maybe some from West Bengal, that side, you know, the, the Northeast side. And Maharashtra will always fall somewhere between North and South. It's more of a vegetarian. You understand? So have a quick, quick way of assessing. Okay. Okay. Let's move on. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, I think um, what we will do is for this particular case, we will just take this as a, a case where the history taking is most important. She wanted it, okay. No, history taking is most important in this case. So, just see the mistakes that you made in taking the history. Now, maybe you can just summarize now what has happened, make, make a good summary. So, uh, other thing is uh, uh, cage one and also uh, just give about the C audit also. Okay. Audit C you have to give. Audit exactly. C also has to be given. Okay. Yeah, that is what I think. What is history of AAS? Uh, alcohol. Uh, as 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 okay. Okay. Because already 9 30 now. You can, uh... So, basically, what are you dealing with? Let's go straight to the diagnosis. Without a summary. What is it? Mini. Harish, you want to attend? Harish? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, 10. So, what is it? Just give a broad diagnosis. Uh, uh, like we, uh, Diagnosis will be uh, chronic liver disease uh, uh, with cirrhosis, which is a cirrhosis with uh, features of portal hypertension uh, in the form of uh, ascites, fetal edema, and uh, uh, also uh, co complicated with uh, hepatic encephalopathy uh, and jaundice uh, uh, with uh, no features of uh, uh, STD. So basically, so basically it is alcohol use disorder, right? Yes, so start off with that. It's a definite alcohol, alcohol use disorder. Use disorder was present just, yeah, progressive jaundice, jaundice followed by features of decompensation, decompensation in the form of ascites, hepatic with, encephalopathy. With possible hepatic encephalopathy. encephalopathy. Now, what are, what are the possibilities now? One, you said is cirrhosis of the liver. Number two. Uh, Acute and chronic liver failure. Yeah, ACLF will come as a DD. Yeah. So, he probably has got an alcoholic cirrhosis of the liver or... Alcoholic okay. hepatitis with the What would be the trigger factor here? Uh, alcoholic hepatitis with the cirrhosis. Alcoholic hepatitis. So... so Exactly. The question may be what is the clinical criteria for us? Uh, so, you think it's moderate or severe alcohol? It's not severe, no, it's not toxic. It's not toxic, it's not toxic. So, but what is the clinical criteria for alcoholic hepatitis? Historically, how many things? How many months you should be taking heavy alcohol? Yes, sir, more than six months with abstinence less than six months. Six. With less than 60 days of abstinence. abstinence. And progressive. Europe. Jaundice. Jaundice. Progressive jaundice. What will be the average consumption for male and female? It's uh, uh, 40 to 80 gram for male and 20 to 40 gram for female. Sir. 40 grams for female and 50 to 60 grams for male. So Thanks. this is the classical clinical criteria of alcoholic hepatitis. This you should know because they might ask you, should we always biopsy these patients? That is what you think. So you should know the clinical criteria. So possibly he's got alcoholic hepatitis. Can alcoholic hepatitis per se come with ascites? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can also come with ascites. And that is due to central hyaline sclerosis. Yes. Okay. Yes. Because all the mitochondria are around there, so the, all the changes take place around the central vein. So you can get an outward tract obstruction like sinusoidal obstruction syndrome. They'll have tense ascites and they have to medley. Okay. So they can present with ascites. So, and then, so, so possibility cirrhosis, number two is ACNF. Will come as really alcohol and related hepatitis itself can be an independent diagnosis. Okay, and then what are the other possibilities? Reactivation, no, because somewhere she said jaundice came down, then it appeared again. So you have to rule out the possibility of associated viruses. Underlying a, virus, B &C. So it could be hep B and C. Hep C. Hep C. Okay, and then if the patient's got yeah. diabetes, comorbidity, NAFL D, all that, is it mixed? Is it a mixed NAFL D? So all these will come as your DD. So can we have, what was the examination finding? Quickly tell for somebody, Purva, what was the finding? Ma'am, uh, in the general examination, he had to find uh, parity enlargement. There was, uh, the jaundice was present. Uh, he okay. had uh, uh, edema, uh, pedal edema. And there was uh, some, my, a few echimotic patches were there on the upper limbs. 
Okay. And he had a, a malar uh, kind of rash. It was actually he was diagnosed uh, as acne rosacea outside. Okay. Uh, there was no evidence of malnutrition, but he was very. Uh, he had lot of ascites. But uh, so therefore, just remember in your examination, see that you have a sarcopenia, test test for sarcopenia, test for malnutrition, and test for frailty, and calculate the frailty index. Yes, see that these three are done in all patients with chronic liver disease. See that the uh, nutrition assessment is a very, very important component now. It's making a major uh, impact on the management of patients with liver disease. Okay. See that you have all the three: malnutrition, protein energy, malnutrition. Number two, sarcopenia, and frailty index. Yes, sir. FLI, frailty index. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Move on. Yes, abdomen, abdomen. Ma'am, uh, there was. Uh, ंग and these patients see that you do an hjr look for tenderness okay and look for an arterial bleed the liver is not look for an arterial bleed okay okay so anything else you have an examination what about the cns which one spleen is also enlarged ma'am okay My spleen is palpable spleen is palpable that's all okay spleen is palpable and you need and when you have ascites please be uh, correct on your uh, uh, the liver span Okay. And other thing is, please don't use the word. Ascites. Ascites. Uh, Mention about ascites. It's. There was some shifting dullness, sir. Uh, okay. Not very. Similar. It's not much of ascites. Okay. No, One important no, no. thing. There's there's no shape globular organ in the abdomen is only gallbladder. Stomach is never globular. Globular. Liver is never globular. Liver is never globular. So, so the shape of the abdomen is can be flat, scaphoid, sc flat or protuberant. Only three shapes you can get. Okay. Don't use but globular. Just if there is, you see a fullness. Just say it's only fullness. Don't fullness. say globular. Not there. Globular and all that. Fullness globular means fullness. it's predominantly gallbladder. Gallbladder means okay. it's a distinct gallbladder. Okay. Just move on. Move on. Move on. Anything. You finish this plane in large. The same fluid thrill. If fluid thrill is absent, so shifting dullness is present. Doctor, see, Purva. These are the. I think next time onwards, LBK let them present. He's uh, he's got they eighty must, one point five centimeters. His weight was very high. This one, so I think uh, fluid thrill. I'm not really sure. Okay. No, no, no. If no, no. What I'm saying is, if there's fluid thrill, so tense ascites, yeah. Absent, yeah. absent. No, no, but you won't come in if the if, okay. if you see the patient with the tense ascites, then fluid will be present. But if you find okay, this, not mentioned. No, no, no. If you find that the, if a liver and spleen are palpable, it cannot be a it cannot be a tense ascites. It must be just be moderate ascites. That's only yes, time it by a dipping maneuver you can pick up the liver and spleen. You won't mention about it. Yeah, I mentioned about the veins, the front, back, and flanks. These are the important things that you should not miss. Yes, not mentioned. Okay, next slide. Mm. So, in, 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 at the DM level or DNB level, finish off everything you want to talk about the liver in one go. Okay. Do not separate infect, inspection palpation. So, when you describe the liver, you say liver is palpable. Exactly. It mentions the size, which turn it up for liver dullness is this and liver span is this. Finished. Now, don't finish everything about the liver and then go to the upper part of liver dullness. You already finished the span on palpation. Okay. At the DNB level, we do not expect you to split the inspection, palpation, professional auscultation. Finish off the liver. Finish off the spleen. Finish off the profession. Auscultation. Just hang on, not to the bowel sounds. Just hang on to your thrill, and as well as the hum, venous hum, venous hum, and brewing. That's all. There are only two auscultatory findings that you're looking for. You will really not break your head for a bowel sound in such patients. Okay. Next slide. CNS. CNS. Let's see your CNS examination. So here, see, MHE has to be done. Minimental score has to be checked. You have to do basic tests for MHE. You have to look at the gait. And these patients may be having tremors due to alcoholism. So see, these are the questions that they ask. What is tremor? What is delirium tremens? 
what is uh, all, all sorts of questions on alcohol and their neurological manifestations. You have to do a detailed CNS examination in all these patients. So what was striking in CNS? Bilateral problem. Absent entry to the right side. Asterixis is there. That's and the dull node, probably there is a hydrothorax. Then you have uh, evidence of encephalopathy. Then? Sir, neuropathy for alcoholic neuropathy. Uh... DTR were at, could not elicit, but uh, otherwise there was no uh, uh, sensory neuropathy. Yeah, but you have to do a quick a examination. Very, very difficult to elicit a sensory neuropathy when a patient has got mild encephalopathy. Encephalopathy, exactly. No, don't do all those things okay. when you have an encephalopathy. You will say patient has got encephalopathy and then try to say neuropathy will be going on. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So I think I think I, 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 so basically. You want to quickly go through the investigations, it takes a long time. So it's more detailed uh, clinical uh, case discussion. So what I would suggest is next time onwards, whoever is presenting, you don't have to send us the slides. Don't send us the slides. You just present the way you want to present. We will interact with you. We will interact. So next, whoever is presenting next time, you will present, present the way you want to present. And the person presenting will ask you questions from you. Why did you ask these questions? And investigations can go to the next person and the discussion to the third person, all right? Because what's happening is all the time we are presenting the history and then it's easy for you to, you know, just discuss what is there already there in the history taking. All right. So what happened to the patient? You can just conclude and summarize. What was the diagnosis? See this, uh, LBK, look at that. No, no see, this, uh, uh, see, that's uh, see, see here, the patient has, exactly. got, yeah, just see uh, has got a significant history of alcohol. He's been yeah. drinking alcohol till now. Yeah. He's been taking for 8 to 10 years or more than 60 grams per day. So we don't, we, uh, your, uh, your syndromic diagnosis here will definitely be, your clinical criteria will meet the presence of an alcohol liver disease. No? So he's got alcohol use disorder. He's got acute and chronic liver failure. He is possibly goes a chronic, uh, the uh, chronic disease will be cirrhosis of liver, alcohol induced, and he has got ACL due to alcoholic hepatitis, and he has got hepatic encephalopathy. This will be your syndromic diagnosis. Yeah, and okay. don't use the word severe hepatitis with so alcohol use disorder, decompensated chronic liver disease, alcoholic cirrhosis of liver, acute on chronic failure, failure, trigger being alcoholic hepatitis, hepatic encephalopathy. He doesn't have, and you have a spleen which is palpable, so portal hypertension. This, is, this will make your syndromic diagnosis. Okay. We don't need to say coagulopathy or anything. See, coagulopathy can be, you can have a PTINR being highly prolonged without any bleeding manifestation. So you don't need to say there is no evidence of GI bleed, renal dysfunction or something. You already mentioned this patient did not have uh, loss of urine output. And even during your hospital admission as a, tre as a part of your treatment history, there was no mention of AKI in this patient. So I think... Your syndromic diagnosis at the end of the history will be alcohol use disorder, decompensated chronic liver disease, cirrhosis of liver, ethanol related, acute on chronic thing because of alcoholic hepatitis, and you have portal hypertension, hepatic encephalopathy. This exactly. will be, this exactly. will be your yeah. syndromic diagnosis. So, this is how you should give a syndromic diagnosis. Okay. And, and don't add this, no, other etiology, AIH, and alcohol latency. Uh, I, I other, no, no, we are not bringing any of those things. Okay. And this is not the way, no, other if etiology, they ask AIH, you, If they alcohol, ask you, no. can there be any viral hepatitis? Oh, you might have a undetected hepatitis B or hepatitis C. But clinical criteria, uh, clinical criteria will be definitely <coughs> be on based on the clinical criteria, this will be the your diagnosis. Okay. So the learning points are you have to improve on your history taking. Most important is if there's a definite history of prodrome, definite history of drug and all, bring it right at the beginning. You can start off by saying jaundice if you want, but this you can just say this is on the background of you, you, if you're a little concerned whether to start with alcohol itself or not, but no harm. In this particular case, what is it? We don't we're not treating alcohol, we're treating the complication of the patient. So what difference does it make? If prodrome is there, bring in fever is there, bring in that history. You understood? Yeah. So improvise on your history taking. I think that's, I think, would you present it? Uh, and uh, putting it together on this thing. Okay, so you, your history together. also should jumble up a bit. Uh, yeah. You brought a history, what has happened to the local doctor and then what has happened in global hospital. 
So I kindly push everything there and form a very constructive history yeah. of uh, presenting illness. And there are some negative questions, negative uh, questions, negative history you need to be included. Then you put the uh, treatment history or any other important history like alcohol. When he's taking alcohol, elaborate on that alcohol intake, abstinence, how much, how many years, is he taking toddy, is all those things. Okay. okay. And uh, probably you should also tell them how many grams, approximately grams of alcohol he's able to take. Then you come to the this thing and put in a syndromic diagnosis. Okay. That's what you should And, and whatever is the management in this patient will be management of each of the complications. Okay. So we will not discuss that. And then uh, just mention about the, the drugs, all these things you read. Read everything but alcohol, you know, the acute alcohol, what the drugs, the role of back the, the role of the psychiatrist, I mean, rehabilitation. And all these other things. Yeah, you, you should know at least the everything. audit, audit C and what the cage question is what is very, very important. And uh, don't use alcoholic and all the other thing about alcoholic hepatitis. And, uh, and load the definitions of acid yeah. and alcoholic hepatitis. What is a definite age, probable age, possible age, all those things to be known. When do you do liver biopsy? How do you treat? What is the role of uh, corticosteroids? What is the role of thing? infections in alcoholic hepatitis? And also early liver transplant in alcoholic hepatitis. This is something which you should Actually, I think remember somewhere in us, uh, uh, there was one uh, uh, very good clinical grand rounds on alcohol hepatitis by Ashwin K. Singhal, I think. Singhal and uh, Vijay Shah from Mayo. Okay. Please go through that. It's very, very given. And all the criteria has been given. How do you diagnose alcohol liver disease? Where in NEJM? Is it Massachusetts wrong, though? Massachusetts, is it? Adam? Is it Massachusetts wrong? The clinical rounds or uh, this is Ashwin uh, Ashwani K. Singhal, ma'am. He has a lot of work on alcohol hepatitis. Yeah, yeah, I've uh, Vijay Shah and uh, okay. No, well, reference. I'm asking you the reference. I think it is uh, somewhere uh, Journal of Hepatology. Sometime back, I read. Okay, okay. How do we clinically when do you biopsy all those things? So, that's all the theoretical things which you should know about. Sure. When do we biopsy? Okay. What is a definite diagnosis? What is the thing? What is the role? Yeah. What is the infections? When you have infections, do you stop steroids? All those things are uh, discussed. Discuss. If you are able yeah, to go right. through into the management in your long case, and then we will certainly ask all these things. Okay. Yeah. See, most important the role of the exam, don't get caught in the history. See what's happened. We had half an hour. We could have finished the case, but we got we got bogged down by the history taking. So just see that the history moves in by eight to within eight minutes, your history should be complete. Eight to ten minutes maximum. Okay, then only we have time because if it's 45 minutes, then the, you have to finish your eight, eight to ten minutes, another eight minutes for presentation and give half an hour for discussion. Because your theory backup will be very good. But if you if you have faulting a problem in the presentation of the history taking, then you will not be able to proceed along. Okay. So just improvise on that. And Vicky, if you can get you that article, just send it to us, okay? Like, ah, sure, ma'am. Right. So I think but other uh, reading objective is this easel guidance on uh, on alcohol liver disease. Okay. You can go to the guidelines. I think that would be the best. So thank you, uh, Vinny. Thank you, Purva. Thank you, Bhargav. Um, we, we tried our best to just make it, you know, a little more uh, persuasive, you know, just to make you, this is, this is exactly what happens in the examination. Okay, so all the best and uh, do well. All right, thank you, NBK. Thank you, madam. I think, uh, I think uh, Shobna, Shobna, where are you? Shobna is, Shobna was there, but oh, geez. okay. Okay. BT is also not joined, I think, today. Okay, thank you, NBK. Good thank night. you, madam. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Yeah, keep improving on your history taking. All right. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Good night.